Hello, everyone, and welcome to this virtual author event. I'm Carl Stutzman, Director of Library Services at Anabaptist Mennonite Biblical Seminary. Here with me helping to host the event are Brandon Board, Information Services and Online Learning Librarian, and Antenna Satang, Bookstore Manager. Our library and bookstore team has traditionally hosted book signings for new books related to AMBS. Since we couldn't do this in person, we decided to do it on Zoom instead. So you're uh, living with us on an experiment. Uh, so we thank you for your patience with us. Uh, before we get started, uh, let's just quickly go over the schedule for today's event. I'll introduce our guests, then we'll have the, some time for the authors to discuss their work on the book. After that, we'll have some time for questions you might have for our guests. And you'll want to stick around until the end of the meeting. Uh doing a drawing for some really cool merchandise. So one note is that we are recording this, but only the presenters appearing on the screen will be recorded. Um, so that's how we're going to work with that. And um, yeah, so with that, let's begin. Today, it's our pleasure to have with us Dr. Juan Francisco Martinez, and Dr. Jamie Pitts, authors of the new book, What is God's Mission in the World and How Do We Join It? Herald Press 2020, part of the series, The Jesus Way, Small Books of Radical Faith. Dr. Martinez is president of Centro Hispano de Estudios Teológicos in Compton, California. Previously, he was professor of Hispanic studies and pastoral leadership at Fuller Theological Seminary and rector of the Latin American Anabaptist Seminary, or Semilla, in Guatemala City. Um, Dr. Pitts is associate professor of Anabaptist studies, director of the Institute of Mennonite Studies, and editor of the Anabaptist Witness Journal at Anabaptist Mennonite Biblical Seminary. My first question today is for both Dr. Martinez and Dr. Pitts. Please tell us a bit of the story of how this book came to be and how you got involved with the project. Well, I became, I became involved this when I was invited. Uh, I have been an, uh, an, a, a, a professor of, of, of Anabaptist studies and of uh, uh, mission theology at, uh, at uh, Fuller Theological Seminary. And after that, I was uh, invited to be uh, president of of um, a, a, a sorry of um, a, 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 um, theological seminary at Ashland Seminary, and I got a stroke, and that's why I can't talk. And uh, then I ended up back in. Uh, in, uh, in uh, LA and uh, I had this book I started and I had uh, I needed to find someone to help me uh, write the book and with uh, the people at Herald Press uh, we made contact with uh, Jamie Pitts and that's he had been a, uh, prof he had been a, a student at, uh, at uh, Fuller Theological Seminary and I thought he would be a, a very great person to help me through the book. So that's how I that's how I got. I I realized that the the book was, uh, or the the series was part of what uh, Harold Press had, had done in in the 1970s, 1980s with J uh, J Wonder uh, J C Wenger's books. Uh, he had, uh, he had than a series of small books and we thought this was a very good idea and I thought that they were and that's how we ended up here. Yeah for my part I think that pretty much covers covers it but just to say that I was one student at Fuller and so it was an incredible honor uh, to receive the invitation to accompany him in finishing this book project and uh you know, what I received from Juan uh, was essentially 
uh, a well-developed manuscript that I was able to essentially flesh out. And then uh, after we had further conversation about the nature and purpose of the book, I had a, Juan gave me essentially a freer editorial hand um, in, uh, in kind of setting the tone for some of the overall uh, presentation of the book. But uh, so what you have uh, is, as Juan has just said, something that he started, but that I came on to and we feel like represents us together as co-authors. Wonderful. That's an interesting story. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. My second question is also for both of you. Each of you brings diverse experiences and perspectives to the topic of God's mission in the world. And each of you has a distinct passion for Latin American Anabaptism. I'm wondering how did these diverse experiences and perspectives inform your own conversation about this topic? And how does the specific context of Latin American Anabaptism influence your understanding of missional theology? Go ahead, Jimmy. Well, that's a big question. Um, I would say uh, in terms of Latin America, um, well, you know, as I mentioned a moment ago, Juan was really my first teacher of Anabaptism and he brought a explicitly Latin American perspective to the history and theology of Anabaptism and uh, what he taught me has, you know, essentially permanently shaped my understanding of, of the tradition, what it means to be a practicing Anabaptist Mennonite Christian. Um, and, you know, I'll just say one of the, one aspect of that that really st stuck with me was the economic character um, of Anabaptism historically and in the present that is often downplayed by Mennonites in North America or Europe. Um, we talk about sometimes about peace in a more or less vague way. Uh, but what I learned from Juan was that Anabaptists throughout the centuries and in Latin America and elsewhere um, have really seen uh, economic sharing at the heart of the gospel and a critique of economic exploitation as a necessary correlate of the gospel and so um yeah and i'll say friends of mine in latin america today continue to challenge me in that way their analysis uh their witness their hopes for a, a, a an anabaptist global anabaptist community in which we can um, face our economic divisions um as a central part of our witness uh, continues to really challenge me and shape how I understand mission. My, my uh, uh, Anabaptism formation in Central America came, came through Semilla. And the reality is that in Central America, where, where Semilla is located, the, uh, the students find it uh, hard to understand Anabaptism without putting peace, economic justice, and the Holy Spirit. And I think the Holy Spirit was very challenging in that here were people that, that uh, understood that the Holy Spirit was what gave us uh, the world and, and the way we were looking at the world. And th so they were very, um, they, they also uh, spoke of the Anabaptist mission and of how they were, uh, they were preaching that so that, so that their Anabaptism uh, was uh, economic justice and peace, but it also called people to uh, focus on the reality of who the Holy Spirit was in their in their life, and so you would be at, in churches where they would preach uh, strongly a, an Anabaptist message, but they would also call people to Jesus Christ, and then they would go out and uh, march for justice, 
or they would go out and um, work with the poor, or they would go out and and uh, work uh, against the government. And they all these things were were uh, were linked together. And I think that that's just part of what Anabaptism is from the from the 16th century. It was uh, preaching, teaching, and and acting. And I think that's what what I was taught by them, by those in Nicaragua, by those in in Honduras, by those in uh, Guatemala. Uh, they were they were uh, linking those things, and I think they were they were actually uh, doing what our Anabaptist ancestors do, did. And so that's where, that's where from them that I saw, wow, this would be quite, uh, this would be quite the shape of Anabaptism where we don't have to link, we don't have to uh, uh, separate those where here in the United States, we separated uh, the, you know, the, the Anabaptism uh, from the, the Holy Spirit or we separated from the reality of the gospel and from uh, calling people to the gospel. And so that was, that was what I taught in, in the class there in, in Fuller Theological Seminary. And that was strongly influenced by those that I saw them uh, living it out. That's such a powerful testimony from both of you um, of the impact of lived reality um, on academic theology. Um, I, my next question is for Dr. Martinez. Mm -hmm. um, your work on intercultural understanding is very deep. Um, a lot of your books have dealt with that. Um, how does an intercultural perspective enhance our ability to participate in God's mission in the world? Well, I think that if we look at that, if we think about how we cross those boundaries, the, the gospel of Jesus Christ calls us to all, all people to, uh, uh, to Revelation 7, 9, and 10, to be, to be those who will uh, work out the reality of being the, the people of God. And again, I saw that in, in, in Central America. I saw that when the, the Mosquito people from, uh, from uh, the coast of uh, Honduras were working with the, uh, the people from, the, from, the, uh, from those who were um, uh, Spain, Spanish, Spanish oriented, who, who were not uh, from um, Africa and how they were walking in, uh, in peace and how they were uh, 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 working toward um, economic justice. And, and the, the, in, in Guatemala, the indigenous people and the, and the Spanish people. And how, the, the, how, again, walking in economic justice, peace, uh, because that's what we need to uh, deal with. And that's why the, the issues of, uh, of, of uh, multiculturalism is also part of what it is we would, would be preaching about and we would working toward. Great, thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate that deeper view of that. Um, my next question is for Dr. Pitts. Um, you have indicated a focus on post-colonial mission and pneumatology. Um, how does your, how does undoing colonialism open our eyes to the work of the Holy Spirit in the world? Thanks, Carl. Uh, I would say that it's the spirit who opens our eyes and the spirit, one of the, roles of the spirit one of the things the spirit does as we learn from the bible uh, is to lead us into repentance and so the spirit leads us to tell the truth about the history of christianity and colonialism 
it's certainly a complex story. It's there's not a one to one identification across the world between the church and colonial powers. Sometimes there were tension between the church and colonial powers, between missionaries and colonial administrators. Often uh, Christianity was, and I'll say in the present tense, is an instrument of colonization, um, of exploiting, exploiting people um, and resources, land. Uh, and so telling the truth about that history is, I think, uh, a gift from the Holy Spirit. Um, and only through truth telling will we be freed uh, as part of the freedom that the Spirit gives. Uh, so when we talk about reconciliation, a post-colonial reconciliation, um, that has to come through repentance, through seeking repair, uh, seeking justice. Uh, reconciliation is the, the kind of long-term goal, maybe even in many cases, eschatological goal, by which I mean we have to trust God's time beyond human reckoning. Um, the work that we have uh, through the Spirit, in the Spirit, is, is doing that work of telling the truth and um, seeking justice in the wake of the truths that are uncovered. And, uh, you know, I would say the Spirit is a healer, the Spirit is a comforter, and so uh, for those who have been um, identified with the perpetrators of colonial violence, we also are visited by the healing and comforting spirit. So the work that the spirit has for us is liberating. Um, uh, and uh, as many have said, you know, our, our liberation is bound up with the liberation of those who have been um, deeply, uh, deeply wounded and have been on the receiving end of, co of colonization. So, uh, you know, as a question of Christian mission, I think it's, it's uh, along with everything I've been saying, it's, it's a matter of the church's integrity. And the church's moral integrity is deeply called into question by the history of Christian participation and leadership in many cases of, uh, of colonization. So if we're going to have integrity in our witness, uh, we have to trust the spirit to take us through that history, not kind of around it, essentially. Thank you so much. Um, that's really helpful. Um, my next question is once again for both of you. Um, I'm wondering about the, the book that you've created together uh, with these different influences. Um, who do you hope will read the book? Um, what impact do you hope it will have on the church and beyond? Well, I hope that uh, Mennonite youth here in, uh, in uh, North America and in, in Europe, in other words, those people who have, fo have been formed by that, uh, what uh, Jamie uh, spoke of, and that they, they uh, also have been, uh, have asked questions about the mission. And I hope that those, that we have answered some of those questions so that they will not no longer be uh, running away from the mission, but will gladly uh, uh, take the mission on. And so that's, that's who I uh, hope. And I think that, that the, the books, the, this series uh, wants to speak to that people, uh, to those in Mennonite youth who will be uh, who will ask the questions about the about uh, the church's mission? Teaching at the seminary in Elkhart for almost a decade now, I have seen uh, these youth uh, Mennonites growing up seeking 
to understand God's call in their lives in their 20s and 30s, or sometimes much later, coming to the seminary for studies, and holding these questions, often a deep suspicion about the language of mission. Uh, and so part of w why I was excited to partner with Juan in this book was to, to offer an account of Christian mission that tried to take seriously that suspicion, that didn't try to say, oh, no, 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 you're, you're misled, everything is fine. Uh, to say, no, you're right to be concerned about, as I was just discussing the colonial character of much of the history of Christian mission. Uh, the imperial character, and you're right to think that Mennonites uh, descended, the, the, those Mennonites and other Anabaptists who trace their heritage back to Europe uh, are part of that story um, in, in ways that deserve some hard truth telling as well. So uh, what we were trying to do is give an account, offer a picture of mission uh, that would be compelling that would say, you know, if you if you care about the church, if you're asking these questions at all, you you care about mission. <laughs> you want to figure out, you know, uh, what is God doing and how do we get involved in to ask that question with integrity. Uh, and so I felt like, you know, and when I began to read what Juan had already put together in, for this book, I thought, wow, you know, I really am his student <laughs> because so much of the emphasis that he, he had already planned for the book before I even came, up, came on to the project really resonated with my own sense of what it would mean to uh, paint a picture of mission that was compelling, that actually had integrity, that faced the hard questions without trying to kind of dodge them and say, oh, you know, uh, just tell people about Jesus, everything's gonna be fine. You know, there's nothing, there's nothing to worry about um, here, but again, to really take seriously uh, the complexity and even the, the the stuff that we need to repent of when we talk about mission. Great. Well, I'm hoping, hoping that this um, helps spread the word to get some of these people involved in reading this book. Um, I'm pretty excited about it myself. Um, we have time for one more um, question before we open it up to the audience to put things in the Q&A box. So if the audience folks uh, want to start adding questions to the Q&A, we'll um, take those pretty soon. Um, but I'm wondering, um, maybe either one of you can address this. Um, what sources have you relied on for your understanding of missional theology and what books have been influential to you? Realistically, I need to say a lot of what, I, what I'm saying now is really uh, John Driver. John Driver has, uh, has really challenged me. He taught at Semilla. We uh, published several of his books in, in Spanish. And he really uh, focused me toward this, this issue. And he was the person that uh, also challenged the, what, what are called in, in Latin America the radical evangelicals. And so I, I liked what he said. And as you will notice in the book, uh, he is, he is uh, uh, quoted oftenly. Uh, and I would inv invite the, the people that read, read our book to read him, to read his, his, uh, his uh, the way he read the church, the way he read mission, the way that he read uh, uh, the, um, um, sorry, um, the atonement, all of these, uh, he, he put some, very good things, and he, he really worked with uh, Anabaptism. And I don't see that kind of um, be as that kind of uh, challenge. Uh, and I would uh, would say the ones that would read our book, I would challenge them to read uh, John Driver. 
And like I said, he, he had a lot of influence on what would it be called the radical evangelicals, uh, René Padilla, Samuel Escobar, uh, some of these people. Um, and so that's, that's where I, draw, I drew from um, myself. Great. That's very interesting. Thank you so much. We have a lot of John Driver's work in our library. And I, I think you're asking me that question as well, Carl. So I'll just say quickly, uh, the um, one voice that's been really important for me over the last few years has been Vincent Harding, the uh, black civil rights leader who was involved with Mennonites as a pastor and Mennonite Central Committee worker for about 10 years in the late 50s and early 60s. Um, his challenge to Mennonites uh, related to politics and race, um, I think it still really needs to be uh, addressed. His, probably the best access into his thought as it relates to Mennonites especially is a little book uh, interview that Joanna Shank did uh, with Vincent Harding uh, that was published called the movement makes us human that came out just a couple years ago and particularly at the end he has some great challenging lines um directly towards mennonites that have shaped my thought a lot and I'll, I'll just say quickly the other another source i so i think part of the reason why i was invited into this project is because i edit anabaptist witness which is a journal uh focused on anabaptist and mennonite churches and mission and uh, uh, as part of that project for the last that I've been working on for the past seven years or so, uh, one of our book review editors, Steve Heinrichs, is the director of Indigenous Relations for Mennonite Church Canada. And his influence on the reviews he brings to the journal, the kinds of conversations he urges me <laughs> to participate in um, and to use the journal to address uh, has been uh, extremely helpful in shaping my thought about the need to to think about these matters and face these matters in my teaching and my theology and my life. So we do have a couple of questions coming into the chat. Um, a reminder that you can also post your questions in the Q and A um, section uh, to help us keep track of them. Um, the first question coming in here. Um, is can you give some examples of what healthy repentance might look like in the Mennonite church today? I would look to, towards Central America where people um, practice what we, what we have uh, uh, shaped and where some um, Mennonite missionaries have been shaped by how they preached. And so that some of the some of those missionaries have been shaped by what they saw. So they preached and they they acted out uh, the Mennonite preach the Mennonite preaching that they did. And so there would be some some good um, a shaping of of how we we would do that. Uh, I think in in uh, Guatemala, in Honduras, in in uh, and even in places like uh, Nicaragua, where some of the uh, Mennonite conservatives had had even lived out what they were what they were you know the the conservative Mennonites worked in Guatemala, and they were really shaped by what they, by in, in Nicaragua, sorry. And they were really shaped by what they saw. And so that it wasn't just the, 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 the uh, more uh, radical evangel uh, Mennonites, it was even the, those who shaped, uh, they, were, they were shaped by what they saw. In, in, like I said, in Nicaragua, in Belize. And I was going, wow, you know, here were people, that were shaped by the conservative 
a, a uh, Anabaptism or the conservative Mennoniteism, uh, but here they 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 were uh, shaped by doing what they were what they were preaching, and I was going wow. Uh, and so I would I would look toward those kinds of people, and th and there were others. I mean, there were some of these people who worked in places like Africa and places that they weren't. It was I just use. Central America, because I was shaped by it, but I would I would uh, uh, look toward those places. Yeah, and I would say quickly. Um, I'm thinking of examples uh, like the Doctrine of Discovery Working Group uh, here in the U.S. Um, thinking about that question very hard it includes indigenous Mennonites um, speaking into the the process. Um, uh, and I, I'm seeing my father has asked a similar question here, so I'm kind of ble as I think about that question, I'm sort of bleeding over into uh, the, this question that Doug Doug raised, but. Um, so I guess if I can take up that question, Carl, if you'll permit me, yeah, to go for first it. of all, say hello to my father. It's great to have you on here. Um, and you know, what is what's the next step for the church? You know, after colonialism, or once at least the I would say ongoing reality of colonialism is recognized. Um, you know, one for for those again, as I put it earlier, for those who have been kind of benefited from the colonial system or participated in it um, in a more intense way, uh, people such as myself, I would say, uh, you know, one of the first steps is to, to try to listen to people who have been deeply affected by negatively by, by the, ex their experience of colonization and to try to um, hear what it means to accompany them in ways that they find appropriate. And this is, this is a aspect we emphasize in the book. Um, and, and this is something that I learned from a post-colonial biblical scholar, um, whose name is escaping me now, but if I think of it, I'll, I'll say it, but, uh, who, who challenged me in thinking about how we, how we how we read the book of acts and the way that the spirit led uh the early christians to cross boundaries and this scholar said to me well given the history of colonization do we want to always just be emphasizing crossing boundaries and it it occurred to me reading the book of acts that there's times when the spirit says no and sometimes i think as christians we we forget that the spirit can say no to us. And there's cases, you know, recently, even in the pandemic conditions where missionaries have insisted on trying to visit communities, uh, relatively isolated indigenous communities, um, knowing, well, maybe denying <laughs> that there's any danger of COVID or other diseases, uh, but insisting, well, the spirit is leading me to cross this boundary, uh, incapable of hearing the spirit's no. And so this is where I think we really need to listen to people who have been most, you know, most detrimentally affected by colonization and say, what, it, what are your boundaries? <laughs> and, you know, what does it mean? What, from your perspective, what does it mean to witness to the gospel, um, whether you're Christian or not? Uh, what, what does our, what might our witness, what shape might our witness take? And I, I say that with specific reference here in Elkhart, um, in Potawatomi, Potawatomi territory. So um, in dialoguing with uh, the Pokagon band of Potawatomi, local Potawatomi group, um, one of the things that at least some voices from that community have said um, is, you know, what churches can do now, uh, the two, what, uh, one of the things I've heard is, Two, you know, if, if churches want to get involved, there's two things you can do. One is to find groups that are really struggling economically and try to give to those groups. So the Pokagon band is doing well financially, but the citizen band of Potawatomi who were removed uh, from this area to Kansas and then Oklahoma um, are struggling 
financially. Um, the Pokagon Band has also said, uh, get involved in land restoration and ecological restoration in your area. That's an, if you, if you care about repair after colonization, ecological restoration is one of the most important things you can do. So that's just an example in my kind of listening to indigenous peoples, some of the, some of what I've heard um, as a step forward. Great, thank you so much uh, to both of you for kind of making this practical um, as well. Um, I'm um, wondering if uh, one of you can um, just attend to, um, or maybe both of you, um, what is maybe a primary beneficial outcome of the way Christians have conducted mission in the past? Um, we've talked a little bit about some of the dangers of colonialism and so forth. Um, but yeah, what are some good fruits that have come out of that work? Well, I, I think we, we would go back, as uh, Jamie said, to the people that uh, received that uh, word and ask them, ask the, uh, the indigenous people, ask the, the people in, in Guatemala, ask the people a, so that we will, it's not ours to say. It's not ours to say, boy, boy, look at what we did. It's ours to say, look at what the spirit did and look at mm -hmm. how the spirit worked in these people. And those, that, that testimony is theirs to give. And so ask those people and say, what, what did the spirit do in your, in, in your community, in your uh, tribe, in all mm -hmm. of these peoples and let them answer the question. Uh, in, our, in, in, uh, in our churches, uh, Latino churches, we give uh, testimonies. How has the spirit worked in your life? And that's what we need to ask them. It, it's not ours to say. It's theirs to say, and when we give them this, we give them the uh, the uh, the pulpit, if you will, and let them say, "This is how the Holy Spirit it worked in our life, and this is why we can give this this testimony because it was the Holy Spirit, and this is why we can call you." And that that's hard for us to hurt to listen to their call. To say. We, we need to th this, this, and this, because the Holy Spirit worked in our, in our, in our lives, in our culture, in our uh, being. And so because of that, we can give, the, we can give a, uh, a call to you. Yeah, that's a really profound way to say it. Um, I think I would just in kind of elaborating or Adding to that, um, the, the one of the stories we tell in the book is a story comes out of Chapel Hill Mennonite Church, just a sanctuary case, uh, Rosa Carmen Ortez, de la, or, excuse me, Rosa del Carmen Ortez Cruz took sanctuary um, in Chapel Hill Mennonite Church for um, many months. And the way that we tried to tell that story was not in the first place, look at this great church that responded to the Holy Spirit in Alcor Sanctuary, although that's part of the story. But we also told that we tried to focus on Rosa's uh, agency, her, her role in the story as someone who, um, as a, you know, as a representation of Christ came to the church and asked them uh, if they would be willing to bear witness to Christ. Um, and so this is a, this is kind of an example of how um, if we take this, if we take our focus off of the kind of institutional center for as important as that can be to how is the spirit uh, working through people like um, 
an undocumented immigrant who uh, who needs refuge. Uh, what is her testimony? What can we learn from her? What can we learn from um, indigenous communities? This one was saying. Man, there's a lot there uh, to inspire us to ask good questions um, and hear testimonies. That's really, really important. Um, we are at about the time when we're going to have our prize drawing. And then we do have some other things floating into our Q&A here. Uh, so after our prize drawing, um, we will take some more time for some questions up until we get to the hour mark. So um, we haven't forgotten about your questions and we'll still have a little more time for that after we do our prizes. So I'm gonna turn it over to Brandon for that portion of our program. Okay, thanks Carl. Um, well, yeah, just as sort of a, a thank you for everyone uh, joining us this afternoon or, or morning, wherever it is, uh, whatever time it is for you, wherever you are. Um, we're going to do a little uh, prize drawing. We have three prizes that we're going to give away today. So uh, each one of the winners will, will get a free copy of the book, um, unless if you already have a copy of the book that, that you've purchased for yourself, we'll give you another one from the, from the bookstore. So, um, and then uh, third prize will be an AMBS coffee mug. Second prize will be a travel tumbler for your coffee. And then first prize will be uh, a lightweight zip up hoodie. So um, I've got, let me see, I'm gonna share my screen here. Oh wait, before I do that, I will pause the Okay, we're all right. Ready. And Carl, if I could add one small comment to Juan's comments earlier about uh, where you see repentance in the Mennonite church. Mm -hmm. uh, I just have to say, because Sarah Winger Shank is on here, I have to give some uh, support to her chapter in the Liberating the Politics of Jesus volume, which outlines uh, her leadership of the seminary's response um, to uh, John Howard Yoder's um, sexual abuse is serial sexual abuse. And I say the seminary's response, you know, 30 years later, unfortunately, but uh, Sarah led a very powerful experience of truth telling and repentance um, that I do think uh, is a model for many of us to continue learning from. And she, as I say, writes about it in the book, Liberating the Politics of Jesus. Thank you. It's a plug for another good book. Um, so you'll have more than your share of reading cut out for you if you're um, on this call. Um, so yeah, uh, we do have another question in the Q&A here. Um, and it goes like this. Uh, Lynette, a young Latina from our congregation, will leave for Central America in a month with the SALT MCC program. What would you say to her? How can she prepare? And are there some particular opportunities for a Latina? You're already preparing. If you're going back to Central America, a look, watch, listen to the people there. One of the one of the things that are uh, one one of the problems is that if we, for example, if we're from Central America and we're here, we will think that we have the right questions or that we're going to be the right and the right uh, uh, answers for the place where, where we're going. If you will go with the, the uh, with uh, the uh, saying, I will listen to the people there. I will watch what they will, will do. And I will listen to the kinds of questions that we, we will ask, who we were asking here, I will listen to their testimony. And that will give you uh, a shape, a, a way that you will be able to bring that back to, the, to North America. And that you will uh, allow the Holy Spirit to help you by, uh, by shaping you. 
by shaping you for for, uh, for the questions, but but by shaping you by the answers. We are not uh, we are not shaped by what happens in North America. Let let us be shaped by what happened in Central America. And so I would ask you that uh, go with that sense. Uh, w- go there to learn from them and learn what they will teach you and uh it's, it, it, that's what we that's what i would ask for anyone that would go back to the quest to uh their answer to their ancestors country listen for what god has been doing here and so that when you listen to that you will be shaped by it and when you're shaped by it then you will be able to come back to North America and bring that uh, that sense to North America. And in fact, I want a lot of uh, uh, Latino kids to go back to the countries, to go back to the countries from where their parents came from, to watch and and sense. What is going on there? And not to go as missionaries, as the people that will be uh, preaching over there, but listen to what God is doing there. And then you will have something to preach here. Amen. I'll just add that I think um, you know, at the seminary, we've done a lot of work with the intercultural development inventory tool. And that has been a powerful tool for me coming to understand more deeply, really the kind of dance that all of us, no matter where we're from, uh, have to engage in around similarity and difference. There, you know, we have powerful motivation, especially when we cross a cultural boundary to uh, to minimize the differences that are there. Um, and there's other powerful forces, uh, that some of us are more susceptible to, to really exaggerate the differences and to, to go into what intercultural theorists call polarization that say there's a kind of absolute difference here. And one culture way of doing things is better, just inherently better than the other. And so the kind of journey or dance, beyond these minimization and polarization, uh, I think is a lifelong journey, but someone like it's described in this question who will have kind of both insider and outsider status, uh, will have both real gifts of an opportunity to um, explore some similarities to learn more about herself and potentially, you know, I don't know where her ancestors would be from, but, um, to learn more about Latin American culture uh, that she shares to some degree, uh, but also as Juan is describing, to really uh, to to not just assume similarity, but to be be in a posture of learning and, and listening to uh, to learn from uh, the differences and to again not once we learn from those di- learn about those differences to romanticize. That's another tendency. Uh, to romanticize, and then we do kind of what they call reverse polarization. Oh, the U.S. is U.S. culture is bad. This Central American culture is better. Uh, but to really see the integrity of these different ways of life and to appreciate them in their integrity, um, appreciate how again we can relate in positive ways, but also uh, the, the differences that remain, um, even as we learn more, become friends with people in these different contexts, uh, are changed by these contexts, not to erase the difference either. Um, And that's, you know, we talk a lot in the book about a a form of incarnational mission that avoids gentrification. That's really what we're talking about. How do you go, how do you accompany people that are different from you in mission, learning from them, taking on in appropriate ways uh, their form of life, respecting their form of life, their language, et cetera, without kind of taking it over and, um, you know, to, colonizing or gentrifying. Uh, that, I think that, that 
those images of kind of avoiding the, the poles of minimizing the difference or polarizing the difference and romanticizing um, have, have helped me in thinking about that. All right, we have time, I think, for one final question here uh, that's come in our Q&A. Um, how do you see mission after the pandemic, especially in realizing the challenge of the churches globally who impacted economically, politically, and mentally, et cetera? How do you see the discipleship and mission, which is trauma sensitive? We have to get vaccines to lots of people. And we have to uh, think about that. We, we have vaccines here and our country has not let them go because our president has wanted our country get, to get uh, uh, vaccinated. And we have to challenge that. If, if we have this, this help for other people, this help for Haiti, this help for Brazil, this help for the Palestinians, we have to give it. And we have to challenge our country and say, hey, wait a minute. It's not about our country. It's about uh, the world. Uh, and then we can talk to the people. Then we can talk to the, the Haitians. Then we can talk to the Brazilians. Then we can talk to the Palestinians. When we have uh, given our, our help, and when we have challenged our country to give our help, um, that, that's when we have, then we're not colonizing, we're giving. Then we, can, uh, then we can say, this is our gift, and this is for you, and this is not with uh, our uh, culture or our uh, religion with it. This is our gift. I, I would say that that would be a, ch a challenge to us because we're, we're, uh, we are, uh, we want our, our country to be uh, uh, vaccinated because we want our, our passport to uh, say vaccination on it as uh, other countries have um, doing that. And yes, here it is. I have one of those. Um, but uh, this is, we, we ought to have every, everybody in the, in the world have one of these. Uh, and so we ought, that would be my, my answer. I don't know what, Jamie. Yeah, that's, that's really helpful. And I, I think the and Dios, your one aspect of your good question that I, I think about in relationship to what Juan is talking about is just some way the the way the American news cycle tends to be so U.S. centric that we really often kind of don't know what's going on. Uh, we don't know that Indonesia just hit, you know, for instance, to take and Dios's home country just hit a, a really unfortunate milestone um, at a, a new peak in cases, um, how COVID, you know, it, it's easy for me to talk about and many others here in the US to talk about, oh, now that we're done with the pandemic, but for most of the world that it's not the case at all. Uh, and so what does it mean for us, for those of us who have been vaccinated and can enjoy the, the freedoms of, of post vaccine life? To, to think about and care for directly uh, the majority around the world who are not benefiting from this. And Juan has just given some pointers. I'll add two things quickly. One is the economic impact of the vaccine or the pandemic, you know, essentially has exacerbated inequalities that have already been growing exponentially over uh, recent years. And so Part of what we hopefully will use this pandemic experience uh, for is as an impetus to, to be involved in reimagining our 
global economic and political structures? How do we want to be involved with one another? How do we want to care for one another? What kind of institutions will mediate our lives as uh, those who share this planet? Um, so those are massive questions that we that have no easy answers, but often Christians have shrunk from those or just easily kind of jumped on board, whatever the current institutions are, but how do we critically engage some of those questions? Since Andy O's brought up trauma um, and the mental character of uh, what pandemic, what COVID-19 uh, has wrought in our world, I, I, I think he is right on that, uh, you know, trauma, trauma-informed mission uh, is, is a must. And, you know, one of the places I learned from this, uh, about this from is Colombia. Um, Mennonites in Colombia have been deeply involved in uh, post-Civil War um, trauma healing work as part of how they have pursued peace, um, as, as part of how they have responded to the, the peace accords over the last several years. And, you know, sometimes it's easy to think, oh, trauma, that's just kind of the squishy emotional stuff you deal with when all the, you know, the hard economic and political realities are or military realities are dealt with. But part of what they're learning as they try to seek reintegration of, of people who have been in the paramilitary or, um, into civilian life is that, you know, once you're dealing with, with trauma at, at that stage, there, there's just so much to deal with that tra mission, trauma informed mission has to be, you know, built in from the beginning. Yes. Well, that's a great note uh, here to end our conversation on um, the possibilities for um, what's next here. Um, so thank you, Jamie and Juan uh, for your time. Uh, it's been wonderful having this conversation with you and we hope that everyone will run out and buy the book. Um, so Brandon just put a link in the chat to the place where you can buy it um, if you didn't win a copy already. Um, and we'll hope to continue this conversation around uh, books and coffee um, and more. So um, with that, we'll wrap up our session. Thanks to all of you who showed up. And uh, we hope that you'll stay tuned for more conversations that we have. Uh, planned here. Um, so yeah, this has been been really wonderful. So thanks, thanks to all of you.